now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. David Bryan in the syndicated uh, episodes of Mr. District Attorney from the uh, 1952-53-54 seasons. This episode of Mr. District Attorney originally broadcast April 26, 1953, The Case of the Silent Killer. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney knows that time and distance are the implacable enemies of law enforcement because they can mean the difference between preventing a crime or being forced to solve one. This case started with a phone call in the middle of the night from a lonely rural area on the outskirts of the county. Operator. Operator, oh, please. Operator. Operator, number please. Thank heaven. Operator, get me the sheriff's office quickly. Oh, oh is that you, Mrs. Deneen? Yes, oh, yes. This is Mary Lou Jones, Mrs. Deneen. I'm working nights now. Something wrong. Mary Lou, stop talking and get me the sheriff's office. He's got to send somebody to my house right away. Well, I have to take the number on all police calls. Oh. What's your number there? It's J247 ring three. Will you hurry? Somebody's trying to break into the house and I'm all alone. Well, there's nobody in the town office at night. I'll have to look up the deputy's home number. Oh, please. He's trying to the door. Oh, well, isn't your husband there? <laughs> Way in Pittsburgh on business. Get help for me, please. Well, I'll get it as fast as I can. I, I don't have all the numbers yet. I, I have to look them up. Ah! Oh, Mrs. Deneen. Mrs. Deneen, what is it? What's happening? He's in the house. Mrs. Deneen. Mrs. Deneen. Who are you? Well, what do you want? Oh, please. Oh, please don't hurt me, please. Chief. Oh, I better come inside out of this wind. Ah, how long ago did this happen? Oh, about an hour and a half ago. She was trying to get a call through to the deputy sheriff when she was shot. He couldn't have gotten here in time to stop it, even if she had reached him. Shot twice, huh? Yeah. Phone operator heard the shots right after Mrs. Deneen screamed and dropped the phone. Phone's off the hook there, rural party line. Hmm. Any special reason for the two squads you have posted down the road? No, just cut off curious visitors. Phone operator's a young girl, a little bit of a character. She's been waking people up on the lines to tell them what happened. Any idea how the killer got in? Uh, yeah. Side door, I'll show you. Oh, wait. I want to hang this phone up now in case the office wants to reach us here. By chance of anybody getting through while that girl is calling. Only call she's placing on her own. You said the dead woman is Mrs. Deneen? Uh, yeah. Uh, where's her husband? Now, she told the phone operator he was in Pittsburgh on business. I've got Pittsburgh police checking all the hotels. He'll be notified if they find him. Oh, here's the door. It was wide open. That's how we got in to open the front door. 
The lock doesn't seem to be broken. It must have been picked. I don't suppose you know if anything's been stolen. I doubt it. Everything's neat. Jaws haven't been ransacked. Matter of fact, uh, there's Mrs. Deneen's purse on the sideboard. There you see. About uh, $40 in cash. Hasn't been touched. Well, that wasn't the motive, then. Only one other thing it could be. What? Hate, Harrington. Can you think of any other reason for breaking into a house in the middle of the night and murdering a woman in cold blood? Mm, no, I guess not, Chief. Now, let's take a look around outside. You got your flashlight? Uh, yeah. Flash it around. Right. Ooh, boy. Cold. Uh-huh. Oh, wait. Throw the beam that way again. Yeah, what are we looking for? I saw some shoe imprints on the ground. I'd like to see which way they go. Yeah, there's a couple of marks here. Yeah. Seem to lead back that way, behind the house. You think the killer was on foot? I don't know. Let's go back away. Keep going, all right. Yes, and a set of prints leading toward the house. He came this way and went back this way. Is there a road back here any place? I've been out here once before, about uh, five years ago. Uh, yeah, a suspected arson case. Farmhouse burned down about a mile back this way. Family named Mullen. Oh, yes, I remember. You decided the fire was accidental. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There was a dirt road leading to the farm, cuts into the main highway further down. Oh, man may have been headed for that dirt road. Why? Well, he must have had a car. He didn't drive up to the house in it. He left it someplace away from the scene. Uh, back on the date road? That's what we're going to find out. Never mind the footprints. Head right for the road. Wind is dying. Be getting light soon. Mm. Yeah. Here's what you want, Chief. Yes, the car was parked here all right. Yeah, footprints again, too. Coming and going from where the car was standing. Now, that's where the car turned around to go back to the main road. Yeah, you left something, though. What is it? Cigarette butt. Oh, he didn't smoke much of it. No, didn't even burn down to the brand mark. Well, that's one thing we know about him. What kind of cigarettes he smokes. That's about all we do know, Chief. We won't be able to follow these tire marks past the main road. Tread impressions won't do us any good either. It's a standard tread, no distinguishing marks. Tires were fairly new. Well, what now? Back to the house. Hey, whose car is out at the side of the house? It's not a squad car. Not the medical examiners either. The boys had orders not to let anybody through except on official business. That's between the house and the garage. Could it be Deneen's car? Deneen? How? Even if the Pittsburgh police had located him right away, he couldn't have made it this soon. Oh, unless he drove back during the night. Let's go around front. Yeah, there's a man sitting there on the porch, Chief. Got his head in his arms. That must be the husband, all right. Mr. Deneen? Yes. My name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney. This is Mr. Harrington. I don't care who you are. Uh, look, Mr. Deneen, we can't tell you how sorry we are that... Then don't, please. What good does it do to be sorry? Let me handle it, Harrington. Mr. Deneen, it would help us a lot to know one thing. Did you or your wife have any enemies? Enemies? Could there be anybody with enough hatred in their heart to do this? And even if I knew, do you think I'd tell you? I'd take care of it myself. That's not the right way to talk, Mr. Deneen. Don't tell me how to talk. You didn't drive home from Pittsburgh ten minutes ago. You didn't find your wife the way I found mine. <laughs> Maybe you'd better rest for a while, Mr. Deneen. We'll talk to you later. I want to go around to the side door and use the phone, see if that telephone operator from the local exchange is on our way out here yet. Yeah, long enough since I sent for it. We should... What's the matter? 
What are you looking at Deneen's car for, Chief? Design of the tire tread. Same as we saw on the back road. Yeah, but like you said, they're standard on lots of cars. I know. Well, let's look it over anyhow. Look at this. From the frame of the car door. Ah, service station lubrication record. Local station. Yes, dated three days ago. 18,106 miles. Now look at the mileage on the speedometer. Hmm. 18,217 miles. Hey. Just a little more than 100 miles. He couldn't have driven to Pittsburgh and back since that record was pasted on. I'm going to get a few answers from him. There comes a squad car. Girl in with the driver. There must be the phone operator. Looks like Deneen went in the house, Chief. Yeah, as long as we know where he is, we'll get back to him in a minute. Are, are you Mr. Garrett? Yes. Well, that policeman drove me out and said you wanted to see me. I'm Mary Lou Jones. I heard the whole thing on the telephone. I'm the operator on the local exchange. Exactly what did you hear, Miss Jones? Well, I heard the whole thing. It was just dreadful. I heard her crying, and, and then she said, Who are you? What do you want? And then the shots, and that was all. You're sure you heard her say, Who are you? Yes, that's what she said. I heard the whole thing. It was just terrible. Then I finally found the deputy's number, and I called him, and he said he'd come out right away, but that I should call the district attorney's office, too, and I did. Well... Thank you, Miss Jones. The policeman will drive you back to town. Don't you want to know anything else? I mean, hmm, an idea about who might have done it or anything? Well, whose idea? Well, people around here, I mean, well, some of them think it might have been Ted Mullen. Uh, the Mullen place that burned down, Chief. Well, why do people think that? Well, Mr. Deneen works at the bank, you know. No, I didn't know. Sure. He's president of the bank. When the Mullins had that fire a long time ago... Well, Ted Mullen said it never would have happened if Mr. Deneen had okayed a loan he wanted to put in a water pipe instead of just using a well. Ted hated Mr. Deneen right up until the time he moved away two years ago. I see. Better get through to radio division, Harrington. Put out an information wanted bulletin on Mullen. You don't want to talk to Deneen again, then? I guess not. Not anymore. From April 26, 1953, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Mr. District Attorney, April 26, 1953. <laughs> Now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A woman had been murdered in her isolated home. The commission of the crime had been overheard by a frantic telephone operator trying to reach the police for the victim. Our only suspect was a former neighbor thought to be harboring a five-year grudge against the dead woman's husband. We put out an all-points bulletin for the suspect. Meanwhile, as a matter of routine, I checked the alibi of the dead woman's husband. Here's a report from the Pittsburgh police, Mr. Garrett. It just came in. Oh, thanks, Miss Miller. Mr. Deneen was there, all right. Registered at the Penn Plaza Hotel day before yesterday. Now, when did he check out? Just after midnight last night. Hmm. Telephone operator said the murder took place about 1.30 a.m. He couldn't have gotten back in time to do it. No, not if it was really Deneen. Well, hotel clerk's description checks out 100%. Well, that's it then. But... What? Teletype them again. I want one more bit of information. Yes, sir? Ask if the Penn Plaza Hotel has its own garage or parking lot. I want to know if Deneen had his car with him. Yes, sir. Oh, hey, uh, Chief, I was wondering where you were hiding. You get any word in that pickup of Ted Mullen yet? No, except that he's moved out of the state. That's all we have so far. I bet to all the insurance companies, Walter Deneen carried a few small policies on his wife. Nothing exceptional. 
Janine's been doing some speculating in the stock market, though. You check brokers' houses? Yeah. He's been buying unlisted stocks against their advice. And how have his investments turned out? From what I gather, he's been losing his shirt. That's strange conduct for the president of a bank. Even a small bank. Uh, there's something else. What? He became president of the bank in a hurry. Six years ago when he married Mrs. Deneen. Hmm. What was he before that? A bookkeeper. Yeah, that is a big jump. How did it happen? Simplest answer in the world. His wife had money. An inheritance from a father. He left for about a quarter of a million. He was in the steel business. The steel business. That could explain his trip to Pittsburgh. Deneen might have been checking on his wife's holdings. I wonder who he saw while he was there. Well, who'd have charge of Mrs. Deneen's affairs? Your know, father's attorney. I can find out by checking his will. The attorney's name should be listed. Tell Miss Miller to cancel that teletype. I'll get my information directly. Call the motor pool and tell them I want a car and drive it to take me out to the airport. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Hey, where are you going? Pittsburgh. Yes, Walter was here to see me, Mr. Garrett. I've handled his wife's affairs just as I handled everything for her father before her. And you saw him here in Pittsburgh last night? Yes, he had dinner at my home. You seem to be disturbed about something, Mr. Medford. Well, I don't know if I'm uh, disturbed is the right word, Mr. Garrett, but I wondered about Walter's visit. It seemed unnecessary. Would you mind explaining that? I don't quite know how I can explain it. But he just seemed to be preoccupied with the fact that he intended to drive all night in order to get home. As a matter of fact, he became such a bore on the subject that Mrs. Medford, my wife, said she had a headache and asked to be excused. Did Deneen drive out to your home? No. We met here at the office and went out in my car. He took a taxi back to the hotel. But, well, there was one other thing I suppose I should tell you under the circumstances. Yes? After my wife left us, he did it almost as a joke. Walter asked if his wife had changed her will lately. I don't like to say anything that I'm uncertain of, but I had a feeling that he was trying to draw me out, to obtain information. Has the will been changed? No, it has not. Walter Deneen gets everything. You don't like Deneen, do you? He's an avaricious man, Mr. Garrett, with no special talent. Well, I don't quite agree with your appraisal, Mr. Medford. I think Walter Deneen has a very special talent. He just missed his calling. I don't follow you, sir. Deneen is an excellent actor. Thank you very much for your help. Oh, I'll uh, see you out. Morning, Miss Miller. Oh, good morning, Harrington. Chief in yet? No, he got home late last night, but I'm expecting him any minute. What's that you got? A uh, report on Ted Mullen, but he's not our baby. You got an alibi? Yeah, read it. Los Angeles police. Mullen is out there. Camarillo State Hospital for the insane. He's been under lock and key for more than a year. Oh, that's too bad. The poor man, I mean. Mr. Garrett will be... Good morning. Oh, good morning, good morning Chief. Well, we've come to a dead end on that Ted Mullen thing. Chief, he... Never mind. It's not Mullen I'm after now. I'm interested in Walter Deneen. You mean he wasn't in Pittsburgh? No, he was there all right, but his car wasn't with him. How did he travel then? Same way I did, by plane. I found an airline stewardess who remembered a man of his description. Oh, great. I check stockbrokers, you take the airline stewardesses. She checked her flight list. The man she thinks was Deneen traveled under the name of Art Folger. I want you to run that name through the record bureau, Miss Miller. Art Folger, yes, sir. Why do you want to run a make on a phony name? Because I think it may not be a phony name, Harrington. I think it may be the name of the killer. Oh? How come? Deneen inherits a fortune through his wife's death. I have every reason to believe his trip to Pittsburgh was to establish an alibi. He was seen at the hotel, dined with his wife's attorney. A perfect alibi for him. Yeah. But the actual killer needed an alibi, too, just in case. And he's got one if his name is Art Folger. He was on an aeroplane from Pittsburgh when Mrs. Deneen was killed. The airline records say so. Pretty neat. But uh, what about Deneen's car? The killer used it. 
chief, why wouldn't he rent a car? I'll ask you. Figure it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If we check rental places, he couldn't be on an airplane and driving a rented car at the same time. Have you seen Deneen since I left? Uh, yes. He hasn't left the funeral home for a second. He's playing the bereaved husband to the hilt. That's what I was hoping he'd do. April 26, 1953, Mr. District Attorney. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite radio station. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater family, you know our friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop by just creating the best pillow. He created the best bed sheets ever. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me because, you know, I'm working like 67 hours a day. Now, Mike's offering the best deal on his Giza Dreams bed sheets ever. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. You'll never want to sleep on anything else once you sleep slept on a set of Giza Dream sheets. A special offer for you right now. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. Call 1-800-928-4715. Use the promo code WYATT or go to MyPillow.com. Use the promo code WYATT. It's good on anything on the website. That number again, 1-800-928-4715. Use my promo code WYATT. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Mr. District Attorney, The Case of the Silent Killer, broadcast April 26, 1953. That's all I want from you, Miss Miller. You can go down to the record room. I'll wait for your report on Folger. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you, uh, you want me to pick up Deneen, Chief? Not yet. Not until we can tie him to the killer he hired. We need indisputable physical evidence of association between Deneen and the killer. Well, that's something we can't get. Yes, we can. Where? From Deneen's car. If the killer used it, his fingerprints may be in it someplace. Call a lab crew. Take them out to the funeral home. Have them... I'll take it. DA's office, Harrington. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't let him see you, that's all. Jeff Wallace, Chief. He's been keeping Deneen under surveillance. Mm-hmm. Deneen pulled a feint to the funeral parlor. He let them talk him into going home for a rest. Jeff followed him. Did he go home? Yes, by way of the bank. The bank? Uh-huh. Jeff says he stopped about five minutes, went into the safe deposit section. I wonder what he's up to. Same thing the county cashier is up to every week before you go to see him. What? Getting the payroll ready. Killers get paid, too. Come on. We gonna go over the car just the same, right at his house? We certainly are. He's liable to see us. That's a chance we'll have to take. Once he pays off, our killer will head for parts unknown. Hey, perfect timing. Not quite. That's an up car. Oh, Mr. Garrett. It's a good thing I caught you. Here's the record on Folger. Well, then there really is an art fault, Yeah. Huh? What have you got? One conviction, assault with deadly weapon, one charge of manslaughter, no indictment, one charge of murder, no indictment. Sounds like a pro killer, all right. There'll be an indictment this time. Give me the file. We'll see you later. Going down, please. Get the door handles, too, fellas. Yeah. Get as many sets of those prints as possible. Yeah, right. All right, Oh, Chief, I was just going to come in the house after you. Morgan just pulled a set of Art Folger's prints from the dashboard of the car. We've got it. We've got trouble, too. I've been through the entire house. Deneen isn't in there. Well, he must have gone out the back, or Jeff would have spotted him leaving. He's got to be on foot. Now, where would he be going? The only place back there is that burned-out ruin where Mullen used to live. The back road. He's walking back there to make the payoff. And we can grab Folger, too. If we can get there in time. 
You say that road runs into the state highway? Yeah, it angles in about two miles down, then cuts around that way. Let's go, then. Maybe we can drive the four miles before he can walk to one. beams. Don't worry. Thought you were going to walk out here to meet me. I did. I thought I heard a car along the road while I was coming through the trees. I didn't hear anything here. There's nothing on the road. You can only see 50 feet to where it turns. You got the money? Here, 700. I gave you three when we made the deal. Now get lost and forget that you ever saw me. You forget you saw me too. All right, all right. Get going. Just stay right where you are, gentlemen. Who's that, Deneen? I don't know. Who, who is it? Where are you? On both sides of you. And on... So am I! Try that again and you'll get it back. Don't, Folger. They might shoot and hit me. What do you think will happen if they get us? I'm coming out! I'll kill anybody who tries to stop me! Oh, Folger! Oh, I'm... I'm hit! No more! No more, please! In silence. Grab my gun, you yellow belly! Grab it, I will burn! I can't! I'm afraid! Just lie there, Folger. You'd never get to it in time. Don't make me kill you, mister. Uh, he, he got me out here to, to, to sell me some information about who killed my wife. Never mind that, Deneen. We know who was responsible. Oh. How did you find out? Who told you? A service station attendant, an attorney, and an airline stewardess. Just a bunch of average citizens, Deneen. That's what society is. That's what the law is. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney... David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Walter Deneen and Art Folger were tried and convicted on a charge of murder in the first degree. Their pleas for executive clemency were denied by the governor, and they were executed in the manner prescribed by law. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. April 26, 1953, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, thanks to Ted over at RadioMemories.com for bringing us another episode with Lum and Abner, this one from April 26, 1935. Here we are all ready to take you down to Pine Ridge for another visit with Lum and Abner. And now, let's see what's happening down in Pine Ridge. Lum has been trying to devise some scheme to win Evelina back, even though invitations have been sent out for her approaching marriage with Frank Foster. Well, yesterday, upon learning of a surprise party to be given in their honor at the home of Dick Huddleston last night... Lum talked Abner into making a fake attempt to kidnap Evelina, thereby affording him an opportunity to rescue her and make himself a hero in her eyes. Well, we've not heard the outcome of the scheme, but, uh... Well, as we look in on Pine Ridge today, we find Lum down at the Jotham Down store talking over the telephone. Listen. Hello. Elizabeth? 
Why, this here's Lum. Yes, Mom. How's Abner feeling this morning? Uh-huh. Well, I've always heard if you'd take and put a piece of fresh meat on your eye, that way it'd take the swelling out. You have. Well, just leave that on. That ought to help it. Oh, he is. Well, good. I'm proud he's coming over. I want to talk to him. All right, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mom. Did I hear you asking her how Abner was? Yeah, she says that uh, one of his eyes is all swollen up. Well, how'd that happen? Well, ain't you heard about the fight last night? I know. Who's Abner been fighting with? Oh, him and Frank Foster had a big fight over there at Dick Huddleston's party last night. Uh, Frank liked to beat the daylights out of him. Of course he would. I'd allowed Abner to have more sense than to pick a fight with a feller like that. Well, Abner never jumped on him. Frank jumped on Abner. Well, a big bully. The very idea of him picking on a little feller like Abner. Well, you can't much blame Frank over it. You see, the way it happened, uh, don't say no, nothing to nobody about this now. Oh, no. Don't nobody know about it? Well, they don't know what started it. See, me and Abner were sitting down here yesterday evening trying to study up some way I could make a hero out of myself so Evelyn would fall back in love with me. So when we found out about that party Dick's woman was given for her and Frank, why, we decided to have Abner tie a handkerchief around his face and come over there and throw a couple of guns on everybody and make out like he's going to kidnap Evelina. Well, for the land's sake. Then I was going to rush up and take the guns away from him and run him off. Evelina would think I was a hero for saving her life and fall back in love with me and not marry Frank. Well, that sounds like a pretty good idea, all right. Yeah, it sounds good. The only trouble was... When Abner made out like he was going to kidnap Eveliner, why, Frank hauled off and knocked him down and jumped on him like to beat the daylights out of him before we could pull him off. Well, I do know. Abner never come to till after we carried him clean home. I never seen a feller get as mad in my life as that Frank did. Just over a little something like that, too. Uh, Frank never knowed it was Abner at the time, huh? Oh, no, no. He thought it was a sure enough holdup. The women folks were screaming and taking on. Everybody was scared to death. Uh, you was the only one that knowed who it was, huh? Well, just to be right honest, I never knowed for sure it was him myself. You see, he had took and put a bunch of false whiskers on his face that I never knowed nothing about, and I didn't know it was him until I'd... Well, I'd got clean out in the kitchen. I heard him hollering for me, and I went back. Now, what was you doing running for the kitchen if you thought Evelina was about to be kidnapped? Well, I figured he might try to get out the back way there, and I was going to be back there to try to head him off. Well, did they all think Abner sure enough aimed to kidnap Evelina? Oh, no. After it was all over and we'd carried Abner home, I got up and told them it was just a little prank Abner's pulling on Frank and Evelina to have a little fun out of them. I told them that Abner explained it all to me after he come to. Eh, I reckon Frank felt bad about it after he found out it was just a joke. Wait a minute. Here comes Dick Cullison. Don't let on to him now. I don't know anything about it at all. I don't want him to know I had a thing to do with it. No, I won't say nothing. I don't blame you, though, since it never worked out so well. Well, Abner's the one that got things mixed up by putting on that disguise to where I never knowed who it was. Wait a minute. Well, howdy, Dick. Howdy. Well, morning, love. Howdy, Grandpap. Yeah, howdy, Richard. How's Abner this morning? Have you heard from him? Yeah, I called up his place a while ago, and his woman said he's feeling all right, sort of bruised up a little. Got one eye all swole up. Yeah, well, I hated that mighty bad it had to happen over at my place that way. I never dreamed it was Abner till after Frank pulled those whiskers off of him. I was lined up there against the wall with everybody else. <laughs> well, he sure had everybody fooled over yeah. him. He ought to make an actor out of himself. Well, he should have let some of the rest of us in on his joke. We could have kept Frank from jumping on him that way. Why, sure. There's where he made his mistake right there. Well, it was right funny after it's all over with. <laughs> yeah, funny to everybody but Abner. I don't think he enjoyed it very much. <laughs> uh, why didn't you and Aunt Charity come over, Grandpap? We was looking for you. Well, we did aim to, Richard. Aim to come, but directly after we cooked and ate supper, why, our daughter and her man drove over from Crystal Hill. They've got a new automobile. Yeah. Uh, they stayed till late, so we just couldn't get away. I'd love to have been there. Yeah, we had a nice time. Nice, fresh mint. That's about as good a chocolate cake as I ever had. Yeah, well, I was just sorry that Abner's joke didn't turn out so well. Some of them was mad at Frank for jumping on him that way, and it just sort of put a damper on things. Well, Frank ought to know who he's jumping on, go around hitting folks that way. Well, I don't blame Frank, old lum. He was just trying to protect Evelina. 
Can't help but admire him for that, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't admire him for nothing he done. It's a good thing it weren't me he hit that away. There would have been trouble showing up. Well, I'm just sorry it all happened. I want to see Abner and tell him I feel bad about it. Well, I think he'd be down here directly. His woman said he was fixing to leave when I was talking to her just now. Yeah, well, I've got to get on back over the store, Lum. I just locked it up and left. Uh, tell Abner to come over when he gets time. I'd like to talk to him. Yeah, I'll tell him, Dig. Well, I'll see you fellas later, then. Yeah, come over and loaf with us. I, I want to show you the plans we've got drawn up for remodeling our store. Yeah, I want to see him, Lum. I'll be over the first chance of you. Yeah, well, Lum, if you're going to be here for a little spell, I'll take that batch of groceries on over to the Winter Abernathy's. Yeah, go ahead, Grandpap. I'll stay here. I ain't finished filling the order yet. Some stuff she wanted here we ain't got. We're clean out of bacon powders. Well, better put that down on the list, then. I've got to order some stuff next time Golf's drummer's out here. Needing some stick blooming and vinegar. They be calling for vinegar now that their garden sasses started coming in. Yeah, Uncle Henry Lunsford called for it yesterday. Better get some lamp wicks, too. Abner used the last one we had to put in his hat band to make his hat pity. You know, when he got that haircut the other day. Well, we'll go over the stock and make out a list for what all we need. Some of the stuff we're out of, we can just substitute. Like, uh, wait a minute. Here comes Abner. Well, Dick ordered wages. Yeah? Well, he don't feel pretty good. You can tell the way he's poking along there. Yeah, I hope he don't think that's my fault the way things turned out last night. Can't help but feel a little bad about it, only kind of it being my idea to start with. Well, Dick never seemed to suspicion that you had anything to do with it, Mom. No, nobody never asked me, and of course I never said whose idea it was to start with. Well, Heidi Abner, how you feeling? Don't speak <laughs> to me. I don't want to have a thing to do with it. Well, now, here, don't start blaming me for what happened last night. It was your own fault. My fault. Why, sure it was. Well, I'd like to know how you figure that. You the one that put me up to it. Well, yeah, it was my idea for you to go in there and make out like you was going to kidnap Evelina, but I never knowed you was going to put on them whiskers and all that stuff to where I wouldn't know you. Sassy fresh. Sassy you got a pretty bad looking eye there, Abner. Black as a hat. Yeah, this big lummox here stood there and let Frank Forster jump on me and beat me half to death. Well, Abner, I told you I never knowed for sure it was you. I weren't going to jump out there and start no fight with a sure enough robber and him with two guns in his hand. Well, that's what Frank done. Yeah, I know it. Folks were bragging on him how brave he was. Well, that's the last time I ever try to help you. Next time you want to try to make a hero out of yourself, you can get somebody else to help you. Well, I'm the one that ought to be mad. You were supposed to be over there to make a hero out of me, and you made one out of Frank Foster instead. I'm worse off now than I was before it happened. I ought to know you couldn't do nothing right. Leave it to you to get things mixed up. Well, I done it just like you told me to. I never told you to put all them whiskers on yourself to where I wouldn't know you. Well, I couldn't go over there looking like I do ordinary. Everybody knowed it was me when I walked in the door there. Well, why didn't you tell me you was going to put them on? Well, I never thought nothing about it till I got over to the place last night. Leave that fire ring, Lum. Want me to answer? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, go ahead, Grandpa. Try to blame mm -hmm. it on me. That meat. blame disgusted. I don't want to talk to nobody. Have a good idea and have her get things messed up to where I never will have a chance with Evelyn or him. I never knowed you to do nothing right, Abner. Well, I told you, don't lay it Hello. on to me. Said John, I'm down store. It weren't my fault. Yes, Mom. He's trying to shift it yes, off. Yes, Mom, he just now come in. All right, hold the receiver. Here, Abner, some woman wants to speak to you. Some woman? Well, <laughs> she never said who it was. Here. Hello? Yes, Mom? Why, well, tolerably well, thank you. Uh huh. Well, now, that's all right. It weren't your fault. I ain't blaming you a bit. You did? Well, now, if I can do anything to help patch things up, well, let me know. Oh, you don't? Uh, well, no, I'm, I'll be all right. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's all right. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Poor little thing. Poor little thing. I sure hate What's to hear that. What's the matter? Who, who was it? My Evelina. Evelina? Yeah, I just feel downright mean about what I did, Lum. She said that she bawled Frank out for beating me up last night, and they got in a big argument, had a fuss, and called the wedding off, and ain't going to get married now. Well, for goodness sake, Abner, I know I could depend on you. You've saved the day for me. That's what you've did. <laughs> I granted, this worked out better than I had it planned to start with. Abner, you're a genius. And Evelyn ain't going to marry Frank after all. I'm going to call her. Well, it looks like the scheme worked fine for everybody, except Abner. And now I'm going to take you down for a visit to the Judson home in Cincinnati. 
Dick and Grace Judson are entertaining the folks from next door. Sounds like a bridge game. Listen. And the last three are ours. Well, they certainly had everything that time, Anne. What do you mean, everything? That last play of mine. Never mind him, Grace. He always says that. Whose deal is it? Uh, Jim's deal, I think. Hey, Jim. It's nobody's deal. We're going to have supper now. Oh, come on, Grace. Let's finish the rubber first. Supper will spoil the game. No, it won't. I can make it in a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes? I don't believe it. Come on, Anne. Use your influence. Uh, Not me. I'm hungry. It won't take a minute, Dick, really. The sandwiches are made and Horlicks only takes a few seconds. Horlicks? Well, that's different. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Well, quite a change all of a sudden. You seem to like Horlicks, Dick. Like it? I'll say I do. I can always use a glass of Horlicks. Oh, that's the one thing he never tires of, Anne. I don't know what I'd do without it. Don't you ever serve Horlicks? Well, we give it to the youngsters, of course. But for late supper... Oh, I guess I never thought of that. I'll have to try it sometime. You know Horlicks... Now, it? listen, you two. How about that supper? I thought we'd decide... Oh, all right. Come on, Anne. He won't be quiet until we get it. <laughs> Clear the table, Dick, and get Jim in. We won't be long. We'll be back in And that, folks, is the way that many hostesses are solving refreshment problems. They simply serve Horlicks malted milk. Try it for your own guests. You can get Horlicks from your druggist in either natural or chocolate flavor. April 26, 1935, Love and Abner on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com for supplying us these Love and Abner shows. RadioMemories.com uh, Visit our webpage, ClassicRadio.stream. Stream our shows. Learn about building another Classic Radio collection of your own. Uh, you can find our social media links, and you can have a buy me a coffee buy me a coffee function uh, allows me to acquire additional classic radio collections and help us maintain our distribution channels that's at classicradio.stream classicradio.stream thanks so much for tuning in thank this radio station support their advertisers and as always tell your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.